Behold! The sword of power. Excalibur. Welcome to the Oh Gosh, Oh Golly, Oh Wow podcast, the podcast where we talk about the Marvel comic series Excalibur and nothing but Excalibur, one issue per week for 126 weeks, or rather 127 weeks, because in this bonus, mega-sized, mega-special, mega-packed Origins episode, we're talking about the stuff that came before Excalibur number one, including the origins of Excalibur's characters in the pages of Uncanny X-Men and Captain Britain, and the 1988 comic Excalibur Special Edition Volume 1 number one, otherwise known as Excalibur The Sword is Drawn, otherwise known as the official origin of Excalibur. Along the way, we're going to walk you through who the Excalibur characters are and where they come from, where we come from, and where this podcast comes from, why we're doing it, why you should listen to it every week for 127 (laughs) weeks. Nobody shall have the sword. Nobody shall wield Excalibur but me! So let's kick things off with some intros to us. We're going to have some frequent guests on the pod, but the main cast is here with me now, starting with myself. I am Dr. Anna Papard. I'm a writer, talker, occasional university instructor, and Kurt Wagner's unofficial PR manager. (laughs) I am joined by whichever one of you wants to jump in first. Chris Maverick, or you can call me Mav. I am a, I don't know, 97-year PhD student. I, less than that, <laughs> it feels like it. Finishing my dissertation in uh, English Lit, Literary and Cultural Studies at Duquesne University. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor there and at Mount Aloysius College in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm a lifelong comic fan, and I am one of the co-hosts of another podcast, uh, Vox Popcast. And how about you, Andrew? Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, I'm J. Andrew DeMann. I'm a faculty lecturer at the University of Waterloo, St. Jerome's campus. Uh, and I'm the project lead of the Claremont Run, which is um, a big academic study on Chris Claremont's Uncanny X-Men run. So this is kind of a, a natural branching off point for me. And responsible for getting me back into X-Men comics, which is pretty much the <laughs> whole reason we're doing this podcast now. So thank you for that. Or, or we're sorry for <laughs> for those people who are less excited about a read through of Excalibur, well, why would you be listening to this exactly. if you're less excited about that? You said so 127 whole... episodes, and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, when you say it out loud like that, it, it now seems way bigger of a job than it seemed when we were talking about this. <laughs> oh, like... no, it's totally manageable. So the whole episode today is effectively going to be an introduction to Excalibur. This is sort of our episode zero podcast. But just in case there's anyone listening who's completely unfamiliar with the series, I can't imagine why that would be true, but just in case. Um, Let's address some bare bones basics. So there's a current Excalibur series being published by Marvel, and we might get to that someday if we get through these other 127 (laughs) episodes. But for now, in this podcast, we're looking at the original Excalibur series created by Chris Claremont and Alan Davis, which was published between 1988 and 1998. Excalibur is a UK-based offshoot of the X-Men formed in the wake of the seeming death of the original main X-Men team. The series had a rotating cast, but the core members, who are also the founding members, are Shadowcat, aka Kitty Pride, Nightcrawler, aka Kurt Wagner, Captain Britain, aka Brian Braddock, Megan, that is her only name, and Phoenix, aka Rachel Summers. Um, I want to get into some discussion about why we're doing the podcast, but I thought maybe we could get first into <laughs> sort of our personal histories with Excalibur, which I think might lead us into why we're doing the pod. So let's start with you, Mav. When did you first encounter Excalibur and what did you make of it? When did I first start encountering Excalibur? Yeah. When did I first encounter? I first encountered yeah. them in 1988 when this comic came out. <laughs> I, yeah, I was reading it at the very beginning. I was a huge comics nerd as a kid. I guess I was a teenager. I would have been 13 or 14 when it started. I was a big comic. 
book fan. I was a big fan of X-Men. I had been reading the series and we'll get to like some of the backstory in the series, but I'd been reading X-Men and some of the characters, some of my favorite characters in X-Men, Rachel, Kitty, and um, Peter and, um, and Kurt were written out and had just not appeared for a couple of years. And then when they announced this series, I was like, oh, well, I'm excited about this. I get to read about Kitty Pride and Kurt Wagner again. So that so that's where I jumped on. So I read it from the very beginning. I jumped on and got this first special edition, which they weren't really called that yet. It was just a just an issue. And then just I color. kept <laughs> yeah, and then I kept reading the series when it when it came out. So did you read it all the way through the first time? I did. I have a Ooh. weird obsessive compulsion with completeness. So when this, so there are points, you know, we will discover over the next 127 weeks. We'll discover, <laughs> we'll discover that there are some points in the series where I was less than pleased with the direction mm-hmm. that it was going. But, you know, I was pot committed. Once I, you know, once <laughs> I started, I was like, I've got to keep going and see where this ends up. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm less like that now. But especially since I had started with an issue zero, um, mm-hmm. it was very much a, well, I've got to keep going, you know, it, because, you know, what, what will I do? How will I find out how this ends? Um, it was a little easier for me because during high school I worked at a comic book store so um, I had a, I had a discount and oh, access awesome. to um, to be able to just order whatever I wanted you know I was doing the orders so I just made sure that we had that that comic in, in, in place as opposed to when I first started I had to like sort of you know go to the comic book store or a newsstand God forbid because it, just in the 80s it was harder to get comics than it is now in a lot of ways so so there was a lot there was a little bit of work early on to make sure I got every issue but I did and and, th- and then when I moved to college, I got them at my local comic book store in the 90s and until it was over. So yeah, I read the entire series run when it started. That's awesome. What's what's your history with Excalibur, Andrew? I think Mav has three issues on me because I started at like issue four, <laughs> uh, which is the, the, the classic janitor on the cover of the all black cover. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, I, I think at the time I was reading around X-Men. So I was approaching it from a, a sort of completionist perspective as well. Just wanting to like fill in all the gaps. Uh, in my narrative understanding, Excalibur was being referenced very occasionally in X-Men at the time. Um, so I thought I would check it out. Um, immediately hooked. I-, I think for me, the thing that was kind of really appealing as a teenager was I loved X-Men comics at the time, but the sort of um, sexual pathology, let's say, uh, of X-Men was very <laughs> serious and very gritty and-, and maybe even like subversively terrifying. Whereas Excalibur had this kind of sex positivity to it that I was, I w- I was really drawn to as a teenager at the time. Especially in that era, because when you're talking yeah, about sure. the infer- the Inferno era era of X Men, yeah. which is <laughs> yeah, the Goblin which is, Queen, yes, a low grade. You know, <laughs> we're we're trying to introduce you to BDSM, fourteen year old Mav. <laughs> Please enjoy. <laughs> but it's evil BDSM. Yes. <laughs> oh my god, that's funny. Well, I cannot wait to talk about the sexual politics of Excalibur. Yeah. Obviously, one of my favorite topics. Um, yeah, I first encountered the series quite a bit later. I think I was probably twenty seven when I read it for the first time. I'd already been reading kind of. I kind of started reading Marvel comics in my early 20s when I was a grad student and I'd already been doing some sort of comic scholarship when I probably read Excalibur. X-Men strangely was my last Marvel franchise. I'd read like (laughs) everything including all of Marvel Cosmic, all of Avengers, all of like multiple runs of other superheroes before I finally read X-Men and I don't really know why but anyway when I was reading it Nightcrawler quickly became my favorite character and then when Paul Smith started drawing him became he became my obsessive favorite character (laughs) and when, when Alan Davis started drawing him and Excalibur kind of fell off the deep end and have never really recovered um, <laughs> but there's there's things that I love about it besides just my deep obsession with Nightcrawler um, I love yeah I love this world that they create in Excalibur I mm-hmm. love as I mentioned the sexiness of this world I love the relationships I love the kind of genre mixing I love the drama humor romance action I love that it's these this group of misfits against the world which is very classic X-Men but as Andrew mentioned sort of a little bit different than kind of the gritty tone that the X-Men had acquired during that time And we're going to get back to all of these things that we love so many times throughout these 127 episodes. But sort of extending from our love from this series, why are we doing this podcast? Why do we think that Excalibur is worth revisiting? I mean, obviously, we're revisiting it as a fun nostalgia kick and an excuse to just talk about a fave. But beyond that, do we think it has value to revisit the series at this point in time? Yeah, I think for me, the big thing with Excalibur was when I first read it, my inclination was, this is so cool. We're going to be seeing this kind of story forever. And we didn't you know what i mean like, like, like it, it is kind of unique the, the different genres and ideas and themes that it was bringing together in 
maybe comics history for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I I think it needs to be chronicled in week by week depth. (laughs) I, I, I think it is relevant in um, a very weird way because I want to return to what Andrew said at the beginning at this point in comics history. um, And again, I was living it at the time, but I think especially looking back on it as a scholar now, um, the eighties was a very, not just in the X-Men, it was a very grim and gritty style. Um, Mm -hmm. That was a point where everybody is sort of dovetailing off of Watchmen and Dark Knight and trying to be dark. Um, We're moving into this image revolution and everybody's trying to be dark. And there's a lot to be said, you know, the sexual politics, but also the the political politics, the um, the they're getting heavy into their race allegory at this point. And everything is dark and dreary. And that's just what comics were. And Excalibur is this one shining bright spot that you Andrew's right was unique at the time and you would think that it would it was so innovative that you would think would it would have sort of launched some you know at least some pretenders some you know copycats it did a little bit but not to the extent that one would have expected back then but I think now looking back on it from a 2021 perspective I think it sort of has right because the irreverence that is in Excalibur is largely what you get in a different way but it's what you get with stuff like if we look at uh, current Marvel series Deadpool or Champions, uh, these sort of meta meta context, fun, we're enjoying this while talking about it. And then you move into things like uh, the MCU television shows as we record, but after people listen, you know, WandaVision's about to premiere. And you've got that sort of thing happening in, you know, in the superhero world outside of comics again now in 2021 that um, maybe Excalibur is just, you know, 30 years ahead of its time right (laughs) this is such a glowing i mean i feel like we're gonna get to one of these issues with weird art that makes no sense and we're gonna be sort of walking back some of these words no no we're gonna this is the this is the first episode you know join join us in about 24 weeks where i'm like uh just (laughs) but um but i'm looking back nostalgically and fondly right now let me have this (laughs) yeah i mean that was sort of one of the things i wanted to do with the podcast to like just sort of have a thing that we really enjoy to go back and look at and talk about but you know also doing criticism as well since we're academics and we have to criticize everything. I think for me, I'm interested in Excalibur as a cult series. I mean, X-Men comics and superhero comics in general are already obviously cult objects, but Excalibur is sort of a cult within a cult. People really, really love this series. They get excited when you just sort of mention it on Twitter. And I'm hoping that'll make that we have an audience for the podcast, but we'll see. But I'm also interested in kind of the serial storytelling of Excalibur. I mean, I'm interested in that in superhero comics in general, obviously. But Excalibur has like a really long and complicated sort of continuity that it builds up in some quite sophisticated ways but it's also got a lot of dangling plot threads and inconsistencies and sort of gaps between resolving those plot threads so I think doing kind of this deep dive issue by issue read through can get us to think about the mechanics of serialized storytelling in terms of what it asks from us as readers I think it demands a lot of participation I think it demands a lot of creativity I think it demands a lot of patience and I'm really curious about when we do get to some of those um, issues of Excalibur that are maybe less strong than some of the other ones and to see what we kind of make of them and, and how we kind of process those within this this larger, and again, largely complex and, and, and complicated and successful um, ongoing story. Um, so in general, in the podcast, just to give you an idea about what we're going to be doing. So we're going to be doing, as we've been saying, a deep dive into every issue of Excalibur, rereading the, the series issue by issue. We'll talk about sort of the mechanics of particular scenes as relevant. We'll talk about the evolution of the relationships within the team. We'll talk about issues of representation. We'll talk about historical context. We'll talk about what we're works, what doesn't and why. Basically, we want to have some fun revisiting this series, but also hopefully give you some smart, historically and culturally situated visual and narrative analysis as well as befitting our day jobs as academics. So for the rest of this particular episode, as I mentioned at the top, we're talking about origins, including the origins of the Excalibur cast and the origin of the team, which is officially formed in Excalibur, The Sword is Drawn. We're going to talk more about the history in future episodes. It's something that we'll keep revisiting throughout the podcast, but we'll try to give you just some broad strokes of that history for today. Um, 
so the Excalibur character with the most complicated backstory, particularly for North American readers, is Captain Britain. So I think maybe we'll start with him and then get into some of the X-Men franchise characters. So what we did is we each picked a little spotlight of something that we think is particularly relevant in terms of framing the origins of Excalibur. And I believe Andrew is going to tell us a little bit about Captain Britain. Captain Britain began as a sort of cynical effort on Marvel's part to drum up readership in the UK. He was created by Chris Claremont and Herb Trimp in 1976 for Marvel UK. Claremont himself describes the effort to produce the character as sort of slapdash. Claremont was given the title because he was British, which is true, but Claremont's <laughs> family left Britain when he was three years old. So the result was a generic and unremarkable character who existed in a sort of simulacrum of British culture and mythology. Nobody liked it. Claremont would, however, write the character into the domestic Marvel universe in the pages of Marvel Team Up, where Brian Braddock is the college roommate of Spider-Man and they have some adventures and shenanigans and such. During this time, Claremont would also introduce Betsy Braddock, Brian's sister and future X-Man Psylocke, but she's not really recognizable to fans of that character in any way beyond name. Then in 1982, the character who had strung along in various Marvel UK publications got a major shot in the arm with the arrival of a young writer named Alan Moore, who teamed with fellow British um, um, creator, Alan Davis, uh, who had taken up the character one year prior alongside writer Dave Thorpe to create some of the best goddamn comics of their respective careers. Under Moore and Davis, Captain Britain became a superhero cosmic horror, a dark and deeply human meditation on the innate cruelty of the superhero's burden and on the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder long before the DSM had even identified that as a thing. The Jasper's Warp storyline is, in a word, spectacular. Even notorious self-critic and general grump Alan Moore continues to look back on it with affection and pride. Moore would also introduce Introduce the character of Megan, sort of, not really, <laughs> uh, and certain members of TechNet. He'd also make Psylocke into a purple-haired mutant, though her powers are more precognitive than telepathic. More importantly, Moore would introduce the concept of the Marvel multiverse here, uh, the 616, as people know, know it. That's Alan Moore created in Captain Britain. It's a stunning run, one of my all-time favorites, and very difficult to get your hands on, in large part because of all manner of legal complications on ownership. Nonetheless, seek it out. Moore departed over pay disputes, and Jamie Delano took over as writer, working with Davis to cultivate the existing threads into something more reminiscent of what we see in Excalibur. It's under Delano, and Megan becomes the gentle childlike fairy that we know and the crazy gang and tech net start to fall into the farcical role they play in Excalibur to a greater degree. Delano would then leave and Alan Davis would handle both story and art on a small handful of issues, notably making the questionable choice to have Betsy briefly take up the mantle of Captain Britain before immediately getting fridged hard by the Slaymaster. Events that would lead directly to New Mutants Annual number 2 in 1986, where Claremont gets his hands back on Brian and the now blind Betsy, as well as his first stab at Megan as a character, but more importantly bringing the world of Captain Britain into direct dialogue and connection with the X-Men line, thus setting the stage for Excalibur. One thing to note heading into that series is that Claremont, to his credit, doesn't immediately undo retcons of the character he created, even though he very easily could have, given how obscure the Marvel UK publications would be to an international audience of Marvel proper. Claremont was a fan of Davis and Delano and Moore's work, speaking openly about how impressed he was with their cultivations of the character and his world. One exception to this, however, might be Brian. By the end of Captain Britain at Marvel UK, Brian was a traumatized, resentful, deeply dark character. And Claremont's Brian Braddock starts out that way in Sword is Drawn, um, but gets progressively sillier more pratfalls than existential terrors. With that exception, the Captain Britain mythology, <laughs> setting, and side characters that we get at the start of Excalibur would have been wholly unfamiliar to most of its audience. But even then, I think we get a sense of a lived-in world when we pick up Excalibur, one with the complexity and nuance that only time and development can create, thus giving the sword is drawn some firm footing to stand upon. Yeah, I'm really curious about like when we get into the, our issue-by-issue read-through, because like when I read through Excalibur, I had not read any of the Captain Britain stuff before and there's all of these characters from it that can get introduced and all of these. I'm just like, am I supposed to know these things? And you just kind of have to roll with it. And I almost feel like that's part of the cult value of Excalibur because it's very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> and that kind of like creates that kind of, you know, effective bond in a way because you're just like, wait, what? These concepts and characters are so good. And for a long time, like you couldn't actually read the Captain Britain mm -hmm. stuff because it was all tied up in Marvel UK. So anyway, it's, yeah, that's um, part of what's interesting about the serialized storytelling here, I find. 
Mm -hmm. It's it was even you know, we talked about, you know, our our first time reading this. I was reading these as they came out. I jumped into we're going to talk about Excalibur number zero um, sort of drawn uh, in a little bit. But I jumped into that as a lifelong comic fan. I'd been reading comics seven or eight years at this point at this point, mm -hmm. you know, which isn't that long, but I was 14. So um, <laughs> so um, I've been reading them for about eight years and was very up on my Marvel Marvel mythology. But to me, at this point, Captain Britain is a character I'd seen in a couple of Marvel team ups with Spider-Man. And he is a character that I know most of what I know about at that point in 1988 from his entry in the official handbook to the Marvel Universe. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so so I that's what I knew about him. And then you jump into when we jump into Excalibur number zero. Since I was unable to get the Captain Britain comics, um, this is a couple of years before I started working at the comic store. There's so much in media res. Like it's a, here's the tech net and just go. You've never heard of these people. Don't worry about it. We're, you know, keep on board because we're we're not going to slow down for you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I like I think the in media res, well, we're going to get to sort of strong, but I think the in media res there is quite effective in terms of sort of engagement just because it sort of opens up this bigger world. But um, we're going to get to that. So let's mm -hmm. let's move on with our other spotlights. I'm going to do my little predictable spotlight on Nightcrawler because I think it'll you're going to talk it about the massacre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think mine will lead directly into yours. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to spotlight the 1985 Nightcrawler limited series by Dave Cockrum, um, which I think relates to Excalibur in some interesting and compelling ways. So Nightcrawler, as we are all very aware, um, was created in all new, all different X-Men 1975. Well, he was actually created kind of by Dave Cockrum before as a DC character and not, not used, which is why Cockrum is often sort of associated as the, as the creator of the character. But he first officially appeared in all new, all different X-Men in 1975. So giant size X-Men number one. Um, and he's been a mainstay of the X-Men franchise ever since, other than when he was briefly dead. But even then he would like show up in like Wolverine's <laughs> imagination and things. So he was still around. He was still around. I mean, infesting the Jean Grey school and tiny versions of himself, that kind of thing. So the 85 limited series involves Nightcrawler being sent on a multi-dimensional adventure by accident by Kitty Pride. Um, it's a very zany series involving cowboy dinosaurs and pirates and sentient sharks and a whole army of tiny Nightcrawlers, both male and female. This dimension hopping zaniness is obviously relevant to Excalibur, which does some similar things, particularly with the cross time caper storyline, which we will be talking about soon enough. But I think what particularly stands out to me about this series as a template for Excalibur Excalibur is the way it sets up Kurt as kind of a point of view character within a zany world. I really love the use of him in that role. It's often kind of the cis straight white guy in that role, encountering this zany stuff and commenting on it and being kind of our anchor point. But using Kurt as an anchor point, this character who is himself already zany, already weird, already perceived as monstrous, is a nice little twist on that convention. It also speaks to one of the fundamental things I love about Kurt, which is his emotional intelligence, which actually extends mm -hmm. in a lot of ways from his weirdness. So my read on him is that he has this uh, sort of especially deep understanding of what it's like to be different, what it's like to be an outsider. He's an outsider among outsiders, right? He's also as a defense mechanism against kind of his outsiderness, especially committed to being liked. He wants to be everybody's best friend. And this makes him really, really smart at managing people. And we see this in the 85 limited series where he's great at thinking through problems and making allies, and he's never afraid to make allies with weird people or animals or monsters that other superheroes might avoid. I think the 85 Nightcrawler limited series informs what makes Kurt so likable in Excalibur and what makes him eventually the natural leader of Excalibur. His ability to think outside the box and manage volatile personalities with calmness and empathy becomes the basis of his successful leadership of Excalibur. After after a failed leadership experience with the X-Men, which ends in his near death in the Mutant Massacre, which I believe Mav is, is going to walk <laughs> us through. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the Mutant Massacre, I like to think of the Mutant Massacre as, a, as quite possibly one of the most important crossovers that no one should ever go back and read. Just as a little bit of history, in 1986, when this comes out, it's published in October of 1986, Marvel is just figuring out their crossover formula. In 1984, they had done a very 
largely successful crossover called Secret Wars, which runs 12 issues from 1984 to 1985 and crosses over all of the most successful titles in the Marvel line at that point. But the majority of the action of Secret Wars, the narrative happens within one self-contained 12 issue, what they call a maxi series. A year later, from 85 into early 86, they do Secret Wars number two or Secret Wars two, which is far less successful. It's nine issues and it tries to cross over into every title that Marvel was publishing at the time, which becomes complicated because this is the very beginning of people started get, getting into the direct sales market and it was almost impossible to read the entire story. Things would happen in one book that you've never heard of and it was impossible to follow along. So later in 1986 in October is when they do the Munit Massacre as sort of a step in between. There is no series independent of the crossovers. You are just supposed to read them in the titles that you're already reading at this point, which is Uncanny X-Men 210 to 213, New Minutes number 46, and X-Factor 9 through 11. And for some unexplained reason, a couple of issues of Thor, one issue of Power Pack, and one issue of Daredevil, which are <laughs> largely ignorable for the for the major series. The plot of the Munit Massacre doesn't matter as much. Frankly, there's not much to it. It's a collection of villains known as the Marauders who work for Mr. Sinister and this does not matter because he is not going to come up again. <laughs> Enter the Morlock tunnels underneath New York, where which are home to a society of sewer dwelling mutants who cannot integrate into normal society, and the Marauders begin to kill everyone. The Morlocks, who are sort of casual allies with the X-Men, call on the X-Men for help. For the purposes of, X of Excalibur, the important bits of this cross crossover all happen within the X-Men portion of the story. In fact, they begin an issue before in X-Men number 209, where during a battle with their foes Nimrod and the Hellfire Club, the team's telepath, Rachel Summers, also known as Phoenix, is separated from the rest of the team and in a moment of despair, manipulated into abandoning the X-Men and going off into another dimension by Spiral, an extra-dimensional being who works for their foe, Mojo. It is implied that this is the thread that will be picked up in later issues. It is not. It is dropped from that <laughs> point on. Um, in, issue two, in issue number 211, the X-Men finally face off with the Marauders in an attempt to rescue the Morlocks. During the battle, Three of them are critically injured. Nightcrawler ends up in a coma. Shadowcat is stuck in her ghost-like phase state, unable to talk or eat or communicate just a, as a living ghost. And Colossus takes on more damage than his human body can handle, and he is paralyzed in his metal form. In the aftermath of the theory, of the series, all three are sent to Muir Island, Scotland, in Scotland to recuperate, which is where they are found at the beginning of Excalibur. The only other real thing of note is, as Andrew mentioned, this is the storyline where Betsy Braddock, aka Psylocke, ends up joining the X-Men. And so this is why she is missing from Captain Britain's world from this point on. From here, we can fast forward a year, ignore all the rest of the, all the rest of the Munit Massacre and everything that happens in X-Men comics during the interim. Them, and we end up with a storyline called another mega crossover called Fall of the Mutants. Fall of the Mutants is a crossover in name only. It mostly happens in X-Men, New Mutants, and X-Factor, and none of those three teams interact with the other teams at all during the crossover. They're all going through major events in their own lives, so it's sort of a it's sort of a summer event, which is not really a crossover. It's an anti-crossover crossover. And the important bit for Excalibur in this series is at the very beginning of the Fall of the Munits, Colossus on Muir Island um, discovers that the X-Men need help. He is largely healed. Um, not quite where he was, but he's mostly healed and recovered from his injuries. So he has his sister, Ileana Rasputin, also known as the Munit Magic. He has her teleport him back to the X-Men so and then go off on her own mission. And he helps them. And during this mission, the X-Men are killed or seemingly killed. This leads directly into Excalibur, where Kitty, having watched this on television and seen her essentially family die um, just as Nightcrawler is waking up from his coma... Kitty and Kurt are forced to mourn the X-Men who died without them, while Captain Britain and Megan are mourning Psylocke, who has also died without them. And that's where we are at the beginning of the Excalibur series. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that I find 
interesting is just, you know, the choice of Kitty and Kurt to be the ones that are sort of cut from the X-Men team and then reabsorbed into this kind of new series. Do either of you have any initial thoughts on that? Like, had their story just in that format, in that series, just run its course? Did they need kind of a reset? Did they need to be in sort of a different context in order to grow as characters? I've always wondered if Colossus was intended to, too, and uh, to die there, too. I mean, to intended to be in Excalibur as well, because they were all taken off the board. At the end of Fall of the Mutants, it's a... I'm mean, sorry. At the end of Mutant Massacre, Rachel's gone, Kurt's gone, Kitty's gone, and Peter's gone. And they're not being published in new stories. They're just dropped from the narrative while where the X-Men are sort of moving on without them. And I wonder if they were supposed to, you know, if Colossus was supposed to be an Excalibur, and at the last moment, someone decided, no, 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 we want him in the next phase of the X-Men because he's just brought back in like a finger snap as though as though uh oh yeah we know we haven't mentioned him in literally a year of storytelling but we're going to go get him just so we can kill him off with the rest of the team yeah um, i can it, fill in it is really here. weird I, I could hear like Andrew just like because he's he's looked at the like Claremont archive at Columbia and I know that he has some specific insight. Yeah, I, I, on the I was birth of Excalibur. I was hoping you would. <laughs> um, yes, Colossus was originally on the docket for Excalibur, um, but there were other characters as well that he was considering, such as um, Jamie Madrix, uh, I believe Siren, um, hmm. and, and a few others. Like he, he's got a list and he's like crossing names off back and forth. Colossus was originally part of the plan. Well, hmm. I'll also just point out um, also part of a plan that didn't happen, but we actually have some concept art for this one is phoenix was supposed to go into a mini series written by claremont drawn by rick leonardi um mm -hmm. which a lot of rick leonardi fans really wanted because he never got uh, a continuous run on an x book um and mm -hmm. then for whatever reason that fell through so there was this this gap in rachel's story as a result of that and you can tell you can tell during the oh, storyline yeah, yeah. because when she's dropped uh, again in issue she's dropped at the end of issue 209 she's taken to this other dimension and she's like oh let's go see what's through this magic door and then the X-Men are wondering where they where she goes. They look for her for two issues and then they forget about her. And then when she when when Sword is drawn is opens up, she's coming back from that going, wow, what a grand adventure that was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just it's just completely, you know, she's literally gone from comics for two and a half years. And yeah, some stuff happened, but yeah, nothing important. Let's go. Yeah, and, <laughs> and she that, was and developed it really hard in X-Men. Like, like he was putting mm -hmm. a lot of attention on her. Mm -hmm. And then she's just abruptly yeah, cut off. Gone. Like, which is why, which is why I felt like I can't really recommend going back and because out of the, out of context, unless you're going to read, you're going to go back literally 50 issues at this point and read all of Days of Future Past through this point. Nothing with Rachel will make sense at that point because it literally just gets dropped and you it will be completely unfulfilling unless you're willing to go through the larger project of spending about a decade's worth of comics catching up to where <laughs> to well largely where you get where you end up at the end of Excalibur. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, wasn't Kurt's foster sister slash girlfriend, Amanda, also supposed to That's originally right. be on the Excalibur team? Yes. <laughs> I had to mention it because a lot of Nightcrawler fans are really not big fans I of like her, Amanda. largely because of the confusion. So I. I like her as a character, but I think it's the foster sister slash girlfriend thing that is like a weight that has never really been dealt with properly, I would it, argue. It is... It, it feels like, I mean, it feels like a pornographic thing from, you know, from today, right? It, it is it is an odd, weird fantasy that just feels creepy and wrong if you think about it for more than two seconds, except that I really like her character. So I'm yeah. willing to like just look the other way. And they've got some great scenes together in Uncanny. So it's always hard for me to completely like excise her from sort of mm -hmm. Nightcrawler's story. But yeah, but it's I just thought I would mention it because, yeah, I thought some Nightcrawler fans who were weren't aware of that would be very interested in that fact. But on this Easter day, when Christ rose from the dead, may one night here through victory in arms find the grace to draw the sword and be king. Let's get into kind of our conversation of Sword is Drawn, because I think we should spend sort of the rest of our time mm -hmm. doing that deep dive into that series. Um, and we're going to return to some of this history kind of in future episodes, no doubt. But we've already, I think, Mav, actually, you gave us a pretty good setup to kind of the plot of Sword is Drawn, but I'm just going to do like a really, really, really brief recap as well, just mm -hmm. touching on on some of the points you already brought up. So you already brought up that Kitty and Kurt are recovering on Muir Island following Mutant Massacre. They both experience significant trauma after the death of the X-Men, and neither of them are really able to use their powers properly. 
Kitty, as you mentioned, is stuck in her phase state, and Nightcrawler's teleportation is severely limited. So Brian and Megan, meanwhile, are living in a lighthouse that would become the base of operations for Excalibur in the early issues. Brian is also traumatized by his own death and resurrection and by the death of his sister Betsy, aka Psylocke, as, as we just talked about. Um, to the extent that Megan is traumatized, it's kind of by Brian and by the <laughs> uncertainty about her own origins, which are revealed slowly and confusingly over the course of the series. Rachel, as we mentioned, has been trapped in Mojo World, which was a huge, th- huge thing, following another huge thing for being killed by Wolverine. And it's another huge thing connected to another huge thing about her being from the days of Future Past storyline. But basically, leaving some of those things aside for the moment, the team is formed and a group of alien bounty hunters known as the Technet are sent by the Omniversal Majestrix Saturnine to kidnap Rachel because she possesses the Phoenix Force, which is a threat to the universe. Rachel is also being pursued by the War Wolves, who are these kind of shiny metallic wolf creatures that want to send her back to Mojo World. The issue concludes with a three-way fight between the Technet, the War Wolves, and the future members of Excalibur, from which the good guys, of course, emerge victorious, at least temporarily. Then Kitty, Kurt, Rachel, Brian, and Megan have a campfire and decide to carry on Xavier's dream <laughs> of fighting the good fight by becoming Excalibur. They share a big, smiley, adorable hug, and that's effectively the beginning of Excalibur, and the next issue is issue number one. So let's delve deeper into some of this in terms of unpacking how this issue sets the stage for the series, these wonderful character relationships, the mission, all that good stuff. I thought we might start with how each character is introduced. We already spoke about it being um, kind of in media res, but I also think it gives us a really good snapshot of each of the characters in the introduction that we get to them. So the first character that's introduced is Kitty, and she's introduced in the context of a dream sequence that's very interesting in terms of setting up sort of the setting and and, and sort of relationship of Excalibur to the larger X-Men universe. And I know, Andrew, that you did a great Claremont run thread about it and talked about it on our own podcast as well, in which we've also talked about Excalibur. But are you interested in in walking us through that sort of opening dream sequence of Sword is Drawn with Kitty? So so it opens with uh, Kitty's nightmare vision of the X-Men. So it's an expression of her mourning, but what she's seeing is these really meta interpretations of all of the X-Men characters. So the X-Men are on a like studio lot and they're not acting like the X-Men, they're acting like, you know, diva actors essentially uh, so you get this image of like like havoc is an understudy wolverine is getting a manicure for his claws uh, uh storm is a diva R- rogue is kind of disinterested in everything um so <laughs> from that we then get um, um the war wolves we get a little bit of phoenix just sort of foreshadowing what's coming and then kitty wakes up startled um so it's starting you out with this this like grim sort of nightmare vision of kitty's grief given shape in her dreams but at the same time it's again playing with that metatextual tone that's really going to define excalibur from the outset uh, again like breaking fourth wall kind of jokes um setting things up a little bit uh and then giving us a trajectory because she now knows that rachel is trying to contact her and trying to reach her. Do we see kind of the kind of lighter tone or I don't know if that's what I want to call it, but do we see sort of anything going on in this dream sequence emphasizing how Excalibur will take on a different tone than the X-Men comics had during that time? Because it's almost like sort of shockingly critical of the X-Men comics in this metatextual dream sequence. And I've always been unsure about what to totally make of that. For me, yes. And it, what's what's really interesting about it is it is both light and dark at the same time. Because of the metatextual way that it's that it's played you know there's lots of jokes about you know ha 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 look wolverine's getting a manicure and his power is that he has claws see that's funny see 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 <laughs> and there, there's a lot of that going on right and at the same time the what is you know so we're laughing at, at at it as we're reading it but the things that are happening in the event are highly traumatic there's a moment where you know i think you'd mentioned andrew that um psylocke loses her eye Yes. during the Captain Britain run and they are replaced with cameras that broadcast to Mojo World and then so in the stream se- sequence Kitty is forced to like sort of watch them changing out Psylocke's eyes which is actually kind of horrific when you think about it and then what ends up happening is the X-Men who are her family and loved ones turn on a Rachel who in this dream is trying to escape and it becomes this horrific nightmare of family who for her she misses because because her family has died and now she is missing her family through the trauma of this dream and then watching her family turn on one of the few surviving members who she you know at this point she wasn't sure she if Rachel was alive or dead but just watching them essentially try to tear apart one of their own 
is it comes across as, you know, there's a lot of horror that goes into that. It, it, it's clearly a nightmare, but it's written in such a way as you have to laugh at it while it's going on, which leads to a very uncomfortable feeling. There's a lot of tension just between not only what's happening in the scene, but the way the scene is written versus the way the scene plays out. Yeah, and that's... Uh, I love that you're bringing... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Andy. Oh, I was just going to say that that's such a horror movie trope too. The idea of your insecurity about having your loved ones turn on you in a kind of mm -hmm. monstrous or zombie-like way. Uh, so it, it, there's a really kind of direct, I don't know, let's, let's say connection, I guess, just to the horror genre at large there. Yeah, I love that you're bringing up sort of those tonal sort of contradictions and how they sort of play out in that sequence, which I do think is a good setup for how Excalibur is, the way it is, this kind of mm -hmm. humor series, but that's like grounded in this deep, deep trauma of all of these characters from the very start of the series and it's interesting that it starts with this moment of kind of intense trauma that's also played for laughs right do we think it's interesting that it's kitty that's having this dream like I why do. is she at the beginning of the comic as kind of the point of view character i have serious feelings on that because uh, so when we talked about why we were reading this kitty was one of my favorite characters at this point one big reason is because as i'm reading things like mutant massacre and this series the beginning of excalibur she is at this point written to be roughly the same age that I was in real life. You know, I was 14. Aww. So it made sense. And it was it, it, Kitty had been a point of view character in the X-Men where she is, you know, she's essentially, you know, you could, you know, you too could be a teenager, you too, teenager reading this book. You could yeah. be part of this superhero team. Right. And and so you feel for her. But in the X-Men through the Claremont and Smith run and uh, and uh, John Romita Jr., who was writing, who was drawing the book at the end of the Munich Massacre and was my favorite comic artist at the time, just trivially. <laughs> but um. At that point, Kitty is presented very much as sort of a wonderkeen character. She's just mm -hmm. she's a computer genius who gets to be on the team. Um, she's very she's very interesting, but it but it's but it's very much a no. I'm tough enough. Stop treating me like a baby. That's Kitty's arc <laughs> through, through through all of, through all of the early, her early X Men appearances. It's the you know the the famous Professor X saying you know or her saying to Professor X. Professor X is a jerk. You know all of that is really Kitty just saying. I'm a grown up. Stop treating me like a grown up. And she's 13. <laughs> but 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 that's her storyline. And then she disappears for two years of comic. And when we join her at um, it's not there's parts, lots of parts of X of the Excalibur run where it's not quite 100 percent clear how old Kitty is. But yeah. she's a teenager, probably at this point. She's she's clearly not 18, <laughs> but she's maybe she's maybe 16. She's maybe 14 or 15. It's not totally clear, but she has grown a little bit and she's she becomes in this moment, and I think because of the horror movie tropes, this helps. From this point on, Kitty is written much more as a horror movie final girl, even outside of this dream, right? She is less perfect in a Wonder King kind of way than she was going in. And she deals with more, you know, she's got like the Spider-Man thing going on where she's dealing with more teenage drama of in her personal life, as well as trying to balance the superhero life. She's still incredibly smart. She's still glamorous and a superhero, but it really really, I think, reestablishes her character for what will be the adult Kitty Pride moving on to this day, um, even though she's written as an adult, a real adult now. But it establishes the new direction of her character away from just sort of the bratty kid who Wolverine takes a liking to, which is what which is what she had been earlier. Yeah, I like that. It sort of grounds her and opens her up in ways, right? Yeah, I think there's a layer of dramatic irony there as well. Like, like everyone reading this book knows the X-Men are not dead. So having this story mm -hmm. unfold around this sort of, um, let's call it unnecessary grief uh, is mm -hmm. really pivotal in launching Excalibur for me. The idea that um, this is the collateral damage of some terrible decisions that the X-Men have made uh, and everybody's going to you know, suffer emotionally at a spectacular, almost suicidal level. Uh, it's implied in a few cases. And I, I think that helps us look at Excalibur as almost like like having moral high ground over the X-Men. Yeah, I mean, I've always had a hard time even convincing myself to like kind of the era of X-Men that was ha happening concurrently with this because I just like have to read about like Storm and Wolverine going on and not telling like Kitty and Kurt that they're alive and I can't forgive them for that. <laughs> and part of my inability to forgive them is just how genuine sort of Kitty and Kurt's grief, especially, mm -hmm. and, and Captain Britain's grief too, sort of comes across in Sword is Drawn. And I mean, <laughs> 
Nightcrawler and Wolverine have kind of an interesting reunion in sort of the pages of Marvel Comics Presents. They like ride a horse together and 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 make out. Mm-hmm. Not, not make out. Freudian <laughs> <laughs> slip. Um, there's um, a, there's the fanfic version. Other. Yeah, fanfic version of it that you're <laughs> talking about. There's a little shipping going on. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. It's it's got a it's got a weird. This is, and this is again where we have to look at the cultural context of when this is being written. The storyline reason. So the X Men did die in Fall of the Mutants, but they were immediately brought back to life by Roma, who is a character we've not mentioned yet, but will become important mm-hmm. in the course of Excalibur. So Roma knows that the X-Men are alive again. She has brought them back and offered them a chance. They've decided, they've made a specific choice. Storm makes a specific choice to allow the world to believe that they're dead so they can be better at their mission and they can protect their loved ones who might be in the crossfire, which makes sense maybe if you're Spider-Man or Captain America or some other hero. But literally everyone these people know and love is a superhero. (laughs) They're not protecting anybody. Kitty, so it's not like a thing where, okay, if everybody thinks I'm dead, then the Kingpin's not going to come after Aunt May. That's not a that's not a thing in in Storm and Wolverine's world. In Storm and Wolverine's world, Mojo is just as likely to attack Kitty and Kurt with them dead as he is with them alive, which is the entire reason Excalibur is a, is a book, right? So it, it does come across as unnecessary trauma, not because of their, because they didn't make a sacrifice, but because it seems needlessly cruel. And when it finally goes away, several issues in the world doesn't change for it doesn't change anything it's just trauma inflicted on loved ones for no good reason which is a problem for the x-men series but i think to the credit of the excalibur series they deal with it in in a very particularly in this book the you know the fact that brian and we're going to get to him soon but brian becomes an alcoholic not because he was a great guy to start with but a lot because of this decision that they've made. Mm-hmm. You know, it drives him to drink and it causes serious problems. I sort of wonder if we're already getting a part of sort of the sort of like obsession <laughs> with the Excalibur series that some mm-hmm. fans tend to have because I mean, it's like part of like my really strong affiliation with this series sort of is because they sort of manifest some of that grief about not just the death of the X-Men because obviously as a reader, you knew that they weren't really dead, but manifest some of that grief about some of the darkness of the X-Men sort of franchise during that time. And I've always sort of read that dream sequence as sort of related to that in a certain Mm -hmm. sense and sort of establishing Excalibur as a different place that you can locate yourself during this era. Mm -hmm. So what about, so Rachel is technically the second character that's introduced so she because she's featured in Kitty's Dream. How is she thematized here? What are some of the themes that are sort of bound up in the introduction of Rachel here that are going to sort of become important parts of of how her character develops in Excalibur? I mean, we have her introduced like in chains, right? Fighting to be free. Yeah, in her house. In her BDSM outfit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. You want to call it the hound costume? It's a it's a dominatrix <laughs> outfit. It's because that's not the costume. It's weird because that's not the costume Kitty should be remembering her in. Right when when Kitty is dreaming about Rachel, when last you saw her, she was in a derivation of the Phoenix outfit. That's what she is. This is her slave costume. It's you know it's odd that that's what she chooses to keep throughout the run of Excalibur, which is probably something we'll talk about more in future episodes. Yeah, and I love the complexity of the female character characters in Excalibur mm-hmm. and even just thinking about sort of the sexiness of Rachel's costume and the way it's a complex sexiness because I mean it is this dominatrix outfit but I also think like part of the thematization of that outfit is sort of a manifestation of her guilt it's a manifestation mm-hmm. of her trauma and the untouchability of the costume being sort of head to toe zipped up having spikes on your shoulders and everything I think really resonates again sort of with almost asexuality that the character mm-hmm. is sexually untouchable and wants to communicate that through her costume and so the androgyny what- of her haircut at that point yes, uh, for the for, for, sure, for, for very sure. much for very much for a 1988 series you know she's got this buzzed i mean when we first see her she's using a ponytail but this quickly becomes the buzzed mullet that uh that is that is sort of a it's actually probably becoming a little dated by 1988 but mm-hmm. but it is very much but it is very much an element of 80s punk culture that is sort of applied to her. Yeah, for sure. And I like some of the stuff that we see in Sword is Drawn where we get the reactions of people like on the subway and stuff like Mm -hmm. to Rachel's appearance or when she crashes into the masquerade party as well. You know, we get sort of all the different thoughts that she's feeling from people and some people are like, oh, she's totally hot. Oh, she's too rough trade for me. And you get these sort of conflicting reactions to her sexuality that I think is really interesting. I think also at play there is sort of the contrast from the last time we saw Rachel where she was Mm -hmm. characterized as uncertain, possibly 
suicidal. I'm sure you know there's the fan theory that mm. she was manipulating Wolverine to stab her. Uh, mm-hmm. And just like always conflicted, brutally conflicted, mm-hmm. no confidence whatsoever, just anger. Right? That was the closest she ever got mm-hmm. to confident. And the character that you see manifest in Sword is Drawn has clearly been through something because she's acting differently. Mm-hmm. Even her relationship to Kitty. Rachel was not close to Kitty in the pages of X-Men. No. Uh, they, they had a couple scenes together, but that's that's mm-hmm. about it. So there's cl- Nor this- Kurt. She wasn't that close to Kurt. She probably knew Kurt better, but but I, I in X Men, Rachel is written as having been close to Kitty. Rachel's from an alternate future, which is barely touched on in, the, in these books. But she's written as being having been close to Kitty's older self, and that's the relationship she had. So Kitty, the younger Kitty, is kind of a stranger to her in many ways. What I like about this series is that you're seeing their relation, the Kitty Kurt Rachel relationship lesser so with megan and and brian but they get brought in here is very much a you know we weren't the closest members of this family but we're all we have left Mm -hmm. so so they're banding together on that which to me is a very real response to trauma right like like if you think about a funeral you know oh it's so nice to see you again person that like i only see at funerals you know (laughs) so this is literally they've lost their entire family here so they're leaning on each other because at the end of this book you know kitty and rachel will say we're the x-men we're what there is now this is we're what the world's got you know we're are, are we good enough doesn't matter we're what we've got yeah and, it, it's, and reest- it's kind of a sorry sorry go ahead Andrew. oh i was just gonna say it's, it's reestablishing some of the intrigue around the character right because we do have this gap she was at her absolute lowest point uh walks into spirals whatever shop uh, and then two years later comes out looking completely different acting completely different uh and and sort of being the inciting force for excalibur to get together in the first place so now Mm -hmm. that gap becomes intrigue right it becomes what did rachel do what happened to rachel it it gives the plot a little bit of momentum yeah it's sort of a reboot and sort of a redemption for her character quite directly right she calls deserting the team like her shame and she's going to make sort of reparations for it and she's actually the one that kind of comes up with like we should form this team and like carry on exactly Xavier's dream and she's the one who has the big speech over the campfire at the end of the comic that mm-hmm. sort of propels the formation of Excalibur which is interesting because it see- shows her being a really hopeful character in that scene and that's part of her redemption it seems to me here and we should know too that she doesn't have access to sort of her memories from that other timeline for much of the Excalibur series which sort of speaks to that sort of reboot of her character as mm-hmm. well. She did creepily know Kurt in that reality as kind of an uncle figure and then later dates him <laughs> which is I don't want to get into that here but <laughs> I don't think it had been relationships written. are weird <laughs> i don't think it had been written yet <laughs> so, so yeah, she doesn't remember because we don't know what it's going to be so <laughs> i'm griping about sort of the much later story rather than yeah. what's depicted here so let's talk about megan because she's mm-hmm. the next character that's introduced after after kitty and rachel so she's introduced swimming with the pod of dolphins and then yes. we get through her the introduction to brian mm-hmm. so what do we make of this introduction to megan what do we learn about her through this introduction well i think it's I either, I any anyone of that's got thoughts. I, I've got thoughts on well, Megan too. I, I, I have thoughts, and I, I have thoughts, and I'm wondering <laughs> if um if I want Andrew to sort of give his first because we're, at, at this point, Andrew, you've read the Captain Britain stuff before Excalibur, or no? Yes. Okay, I hadn't. Right. So my relationship to Megan is very different now or even i think i read the captain britain stories or or, or any of the captain britain's stories later five or ten years into it after this has started so quite 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 a while ago but it was into the into my reading and liking excalibur when i got to go back and read some of that and here we're getting a megan who is delightful and lovely and childlike and you know you're i mean you're supposed to look at her as this magical girl right she's almost simplistic she's got this childlike and sense but she loves to play and she's beautiful and there's an aspect to that which i find much more troubling now having read captain britain in that she is essentially captain britain for me and i'm glad you mentioned those stories about her being unrecognizable she is very almost demonic when she first appears and there's hints of that in this series but not or in this issue rather but she is demonic and basically restructures herself to be with her pot with her mutant powers she's like oh, I'm just going to be Brian's perfect idea of hot and he will fall in love with me. And then he does, which is sort of a problem that will come up later in the series, but isn't as apparent here, except for the fact that we do get to see that Brian is now physically and verbally abusive to her. Yeah, he's yeah. He's, he's mean to a dolphin, which is like, 
major <laughs> taboo. And to her, I mean, he he doesn't quite strike her, but all but when she yeah, is just yeah. worried. And and I mean, I, I get that the excuse is he just watched his twin sister die on international television. Never I, a good excuse yeah, to get no, your no, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's kind of and I don't think the book I don't think the book is asked. Well, I know later issues are not asking us to feel sorry for him. But even here, I don't think it's asking. I think it's asking us to feel sorry for him, but not forgive him. Yeah, his pain is having collateral damage as well. That's clearly manifest in Megan. I, I don't know. I, I think I've talked to Anne about this before. I hate this relationship. Yeah, it is more inappropriate than Colossus and Kitty to me. And that's a really inappropriate relationship. <laughs> I, it's abusive it's it's yeah. it's abusive and then it works out and particularly we'll fast forward to modern times the abusive stuff is not really talked about in modern marvel comics they just forget a lot of this happened which is which is a focal point to much of what happens in you know throughout this 127 issue run we're gonna see a lot of a lot of their relationship building and their problems is kind of foundational to what excalibur is and a lot of it's just sort of glossed over and they're just happy now well this is, this is my <laughs> opinion on what claremont's working with here I, I think he was specifically trying to portray an abusive relationship i don't think mm -hmm. he wanted the audience to want them to get together at any point um, no. but that thread never really got resolved fully and then other writers came along and started romanticizing Brian and Megan in a way that I'm, I'm deeply uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. huh, that's interesting. I've got mixed feelings about it. Like, I mean, I don't know. I think we're going to talk about it more when we kind of get to it and we see some of the character development that happens with Brian. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that, yeah, I, again, I'm not going to weigh in on sort of the, you know, whether I think that these two should end up together or not now. But I will say that what I like about the kind of intro of Megan here is that we have her introduced sort of in a bit of a monstrous way. You know, like we see some of that subversion of her being a sexy character by introducing her sort of in the shape of a dolphin where she's a little bit monstrous and then we get her shifting into that perfect form that she has with brian you know which you know again is bound up with the abusive relationship and sort of guilt and trying to please him and all of these really kind of terrifying things mm -hmm. and then we see her retreating into the bedroom where she sort of reverts to a little bit of her kind of you know monstrous form a little bit she sort of looks more childlike she looks like more demonic and then you know we see her feeling sorry for herself and kind of curled up in a fetal position then she resumes her sort of beautiful megan appearance when she goes and has to you know <laughs> effectively try to kind of mm -hmm. save Brian by, you know, going and, mm -hmm. and, and finding Kitty at, at Muir Island, which is when the TechNet attacks. But then we also get to see glimpses of Megan being kind of a powerhouse character as well, which is a role mm -hmm. that she'll have on the team from various points. So I like the way it's teasing some of the sort of complexity mm -hmm. that that character can have. I don't think that that's always handled well. And we're definitely going to get into the relationship stuff and the relationship triangle between mm -hmm. Brian and Kurt and Megan, which I do find interesting but underexplored in certain ways, mm -hmm. particularly in relation to the way Megan empathic powers work yeah mm -hmm. and that's the vehicle right the idea of an empathic shapeshifter who just becomes whatever you want her to be and thus kind of mm -hmm. loses herself there's so much mm -hmm. potential there and i think he's trying here i think i think claremont is trying to explore that and, and this is again this is the first issue of this journey i believe he is trying to explore that here um the fact that she literally changes you know she she's the wife that can't allow you know has to wake up before the husband and put her makeup on and then go back to bed yeah. she yeah. you know she is changing into his ideal woman the second before she sees him retreats yeah. back when she's upset and then she's like oh i'm going to go out now she's going out to see kitty she doesn't know kurt's awake she's going out to see kitty and ask mm -hmm. for help and even then she has to put her makeup back on in order to leave the door i think there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's happening with her and i think particularly throughout the series we're gonna we're gonna progress through megan's character in which as an empath she is very much a I'm going to let myself be defined by the men in my life character for much of this. Mm -hmm. But I think there's an awareness to this, which sort of particularly when contrasting her with Rachel and Kitty, there's an awareness to what Megan is that makes it not a mistake, right? She's not just she's not just a girlfriend to be fridged for right. um for Captain Britain's redemption. You know, she's got her own art going on and it starts with her being in this traumatic, abusive relationship that at least for much of this, her friends can't see. Certainly not at this point. Kurt will kind of comment on it in a scene that we're going to get to in a couple minutes. But but it is very much a their life's not perfect, despite the fact that she is dating the national superhero. Yeah. Yeah. And I like I think that it's sort of psychologically sympathetic the way she's introduced in ways that sort of bring us inside her psychology in ways that I do find positive despite sort of the negativity of that relationship but um, we've already talked about 
Brian a little bit. Do you want to just talk about Kurt's intro and then kind of get back to Brian? Because I want to talk about that mm -hmm. fight between Brian and Kurt as a contrast. <laughs> but I also want to say my little bit about <laughs> Kurt's intro and how great it is and how wonderful it is as a setup for him. Well, so we get we get yeah. Kurt introduced sort of fighting robotic musketeers and pirates <laughs> in kind of some sort of danger room, which is real classic Nightcaller being this jokester swashbuckler type of figure. But then what I think is so great is how like it gets undercut by this intrusion of reality where he gets stabbed by a sword by one of these one of these robots because he is operating the program without the safety protocols he instinctively teleports to save himself he has forgotten that his teleportation doesn't work as well as it used to be that it, as it used to he's on the floor and he can't even reach up he's so like you know so exhausted just from that one teleport that he can't even reach up to turn off the program and save himself and luckily kitty comes in and 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 shorts out the program so he doesn't die and then she tears into him for running the program with the safety is disengaged and he has this thing about you know he's being super macho but it's like i had to see if i'd lost my edge and everything and she's just like what the hell kurt <laughs> and you get this conversation about how he has maybe this death wish either related to sort of guilt about his newfound disability or more directly related to his guilt that he because he even says this his guilt about not being present when the x-men were killed and yeah just seeing that kind of old nightcrawler sort of the jokester kind of figure with this intrusion of reality i think is really powerful in terms of what's going to happen to Kurt's character development in Excalibur and it really sets that up well we have the old Kurt and kind of the new Kurt and showing too how those two things are related that you know his sort of escapes into fantasy are related to trauma I mean he's here in the danger room running this program as a manifestation of trauma in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and the way it sort of manifests those contradictions of the character but also shows sort of signals what his character development will be I just love that so much I wanted to ask you because again your favorite character and this is so this sequence is the focal point of the Kitty Kurt relationship throughout the rest of the book and much of the yeah. series. We're establishing the status quo. Now they were close. They were very close in the X-Men days. This is not a change from where they were. Kitty is very much a supporting character in the Nightcrawler series that you listed. And this is um, you know, Kitty is effectively Kurt's little sister. This is how they treat each other, you know, little sister, big brother. And she's walked in on this and she basically accuses him of trying to kill himself in order yeah. to you know in order to be with the rest of their family and he doesn't deny it mm -hmm. you know it's it, it and this is and again they do have a relationship where he is clearly the older brother she is clearly the younger sister and he is he is usually very parental and protective towards her but she lays into him here there and she's like what are you doing what the hell's wrong with you and she takes on the more parental role suddenly in you know in chastising her and there's a so it gives in, in chastising him so it gives them sort of an equal footing suddenly that wasn't present in the x-men books so i like i wonder what you make of it you know was he really trying to kill himself is she right in calling him out on this and what do you think this does to their you know it's only like three pages but what does this do to their relationship as they're you know sort of talking things through and talking about the way that they are jointly dealing with this trauma sort of together and apart at the same time yeah i love this scene so like this is like an iconic kitty kurt scene like it's one of the top three all-time kitty kurt scenes i mean just the <laughs> way that you know if we're gonna rank these things if you're a person that cares about these things <laughs> um but anyway yeah but like the way that we see sort of her maturity sort of manifesting through him and that's sort of something that had been in uncanny too but i think this is sort of an extension of that that sort of some of kitty's moments of maturity manifest through her getting over her initial fear of kurt and mm -hmm. becoming one of his kind of strongest supporters you know she has two iconic speeches both in god love man god loves man kills and um and another one in the pages of uncanny where you know Kurt's being attacked by a mob or like um, the reverend is calling him you know you dare call that thing human and Kitty has the impassioned speeches about Kurt is the best of us and he's my friend and I choose him over everybody else mm -hmm. so they do have this kind of deep bond from there but I think kind of the it's like once again sort of groundedness and intrusion of reality that we have here with her kind of yelling at him and which is not something we'd really seen before mm -hmm. and kind of you know accusing him of having a lack of maturity and her maturity almost embarrasses him <laughs> into realizing <laughs> that he is being really immature and that's sort of the start of of his progression into a different type of character so i really love the way they kind of work against each other here and sort of provoke their own character development i just love it so much mm -hmm. yeah i really like kitty's anger in particular for a lot of the reasons you're mm -hmm. saying anna just because it's out of character but specifically the idea that nightcrawler is always sort of the soul of the team uh, mm -hmm. and kitty's 
watching her you know metaphorical soul start to lose faith a little bit yes. uh, and i think it's really cool as a character that her response to that is like will uh, and she's just going to shout at it until it's ready to fight again which mm -hmm. kind of awesome it's a nice heroic beat for kitty uh, and i think it really establishes her at least in this issue as the motivational force behind the team there's an intentionality behind it because she's aware of what's going on and she is not the loving soul of the team at least not yet and she's not capable of being it and but she knows that right now you know she knows everybody else is dead she knows kurt's been in a coma for two years she knows he's hurting he's her family and she knows it's her job now to be there for him because there's no one left and this is the only way she knows how to do it she's like okay i don't know i'm gonna yell at you till you're better <laughs> and <laughs> and which which is again in my mind i'm gonna place her as just because i you know i was calling her 14 when the x-men died i'm gonna say she's 15 going on 16 here ish and this is the and this is basically who she is right here it's what you know i don't know how to handle this so all i can do is yell but i know i have to fix you because i need you too you know? yeah, well, and yeah and the identifiableness of that like her coming out of this trauma and like sort of the one adult ish figure that she has left is kurt and he's in the danger room <laughs> like with a death wish trying to kill himself right. i mean he deserves to be yelled at yeah <laughs> and and you know you i mean andrew you mentioned you mentioned you know the complicated relationship between colossus and kitty i'll, I'll put it that <laughs> way but it's still her boyfriend that she just watched get killed on television <laughs> you, know, you know along with essentially everyone else that she loves it's it's a weirdness to where she has no one else to fall on she has no one to lean on she is a kid she's a very responsible kid but she is one and to me this this entire scene reads as i need you to be better i need you to be better so yeah. that i can fall apart <laughs> because i'm the kid and you're the grown-up so you know shape up is is what she's telling him and i think in doing so, this is where, and what makes Sword is Drawn interesting with Kitty as a focal character is this is where, this is where Kitty really starts to grow up and starts to realize as mature a 14 year old as she is, now she's a 15 year old who has to be a grown up and the world's different for you now. So how are you going to navigate? Yeah. And there's, there's sort of a, a connective tissue to the, the, the writing of the actual story here, or maybe just the theme mm -hmm. of the issue. The whole point of the Sword is Drawn is being broken and finding the will to get back up uh, mm -hmm. and kitty is that will in, in this issue mm -hmm. everyone else is completely incapable of as you said being an adult uh so it, it's up to her and that inversion and being out of character like that that really shows that maturation that you're talking about math well can we talk i want to talk about so one of the other i mean again for nightcrawler but i think for this series as a whole in terms of setting up sort of the contrast between the characters and sort of the motivations for the characters is that fight between kurt and brian that i mentioned so, <laughs> so what ha it's one of my favorite scenes so we got to talk about it but um mm -hmm. so what happens is that megan goes to muir island she finds kitty and kurt there after the scene we were just talking about the tech net shows up um we will mention them briefly we're going to be coming back to them um they kidnap uh kitty and megan and kurt it manages to teleport away and then he goes to find brian at the lighthouse because he obviously needs help rescuing them and then you get this showdown between kurt and brian where kurt shows up at the lighthouse captain Britton is drunk he tosses brian in the ocean <laughs> and then they have this fight and mm -hmm. andrew you gave such a wonderful description of this scene one time in terms of kurt gives this speech about being a a hero and you said that Kurt is talking like to Brian but he's really talking about himself could you mm -hmm. sort of walk walk the listeners through that a little bit I, I think you kind of hit it exactly right it, it, it's a pep talk it's he, he's had this sort of call to consciousness from Kitty let's say mm -hmm. realizing the mistakes that he's been making and he's needing to find that sort of follow through to get him to where he wants to be now um so helping out brian is a way for him to kind of externalize his own ambitions mm -hmm. and allow him to kind of help himself uh it, it's it's like clearly the speech goes way beyond the mechanics of yes. the scene that they're actually in i think for me the speech and it's not it's not part of the speech but there's a very important thing that really gives context to this to this speech that happens a few pages before when the tech net comes to attack megan is going to visit kitty at that point so she 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 jumps in and says hi and nightcrawler has never met her before and nightcrawler doesn't know i don't know if they've ever met before but he doesn't know captain britain because um he turned because you know he was unconscious he was in a coma during the, during the time where psylocke really joins the team mm -hmm. he i guess he met her in that one new minute annual megan shows up nightcrawler says who and 
Kitty has to tell him that's Megan, Captain Girl, Captain Captain Britain's girlfriend, and he says, "Well, she certainly knows how to make an entrance." By the way, Catchton, who's Captain Britain? He has no idea who these people are. Like he's, <laughs> he he literally has no idea. All he knows, and he, and again, he's been up until just this moment. He's been wallowing in his own pain and trauma, but now Kitty needs help. Now yes. he has he has no he has no time to be in pain. He has no time for his trauma. You know, the only family he has left, as far as he knows, has been kidnapped by space aliens. He can't save her uh, uh, save her alone. So it's like, well, all right, I'm gonna go find Captain Britain. He finds Captain Britain. Captain Britain is unconscious from drinking himself into a stupor, and Kurt does not have time for this because the Kurt from X-Men was way too happy go lucky to, you know, Kurt's seen Wolverine in a, on a bender like this before. He didn't have time to deal with Captain Britain on a on a bender. I don't know this dude. Look, I'm going to throw you in the ocean. You survive, you don't. Let's figure it out. <laughs> you know, he he just does not have the time for Captain Britain's BS. So, that's where he starts from and that is what I think um, makes him realize, okay, yeah, maybe you're dealing with trauma. So are we all. So now I'm going to yell at you while really yelling at myself. So yes, I yes. think that Kurt needs, Kurt needs Brian to be more, to be more broken from than he is in order for Kurt to be better. <laughs> I love that. I was just, what I was thinking throughout that was just like, yeah, he's yelling at Brian, but he's really yelling at himself because he's seen his, his, his inadequacies reflected back to him through Kitty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just love this scene for Kurt so much. Like the first time I encountered it, I was just like, it was like a game changer scene for him. Like we'd never seen him get angry like this before, like throw somebody up against the wall and like yell at them. Yeah. We'd seen him stand up for people before, but we'd never seen him do something like this. Mm -hmm. And I think showing that he's capable of sort of doing this and setting him up as a leader as well well sort of setting up his capacity to sort of manage the people on this team and not again as you're saying just be that sort of happy-go-lucky being everybody's best friend character because it was sort of like the obsession with being liked that often made him a bad leader of the x-men i know mm -hmm. andrew you've written on claremont run before about sort of his self-sacrificing nature as a leader of the x-men and sort of you know that related to in my mind anyway some of his sort of obsession with being liked and here he's not afraid to like make brian hate him he's just like <laughs> we have to get shit done yeah. and it's so great I don't know this guy. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just at the end of that anyway, scene, there's yeah. coming back to what Mav was saying earlier. There's our second member of the superhero team expressing suicidal thoughts. Yes. This is a yes. dark place yeah. that we're, we're launching from. Mm -hmm. It is. I know. And then we keep talking about this being a humor series. But um, <laughs> but anyway, let's touch on a few more things before we mm -hmm. completely run out of time, because I did promise this would be a mega sized episode, but we are probably mm -hmm. running a little bit long. So what do we make of the antagonists in this series? We haven't talked about them much. <laughs> They and we will get into it in future episodes. <laughs> well, if that's if that's the argument that they kind of don't matter, that's an interesting argument, though, right? Yes. I mean, what is what do we sort of get established about what the mission of Excalibur is going to be? Kind of like based on the antagonists in the series. So this is why I asked Andrew earlier, like uh, to to clarify that. Uh, he, so he, he had read the Captain Britain story first because I had not. I knew what war rules were from reading X Men. Like I'd seen them in Mojoverse. So they okay. Rachel is running from Mojo, so the Warwolves are chasing her. That makes sense. The TechNet, I'd never heard of. I had no idea. And basically, in this fight, Claremont shows me that I don't need to know anything because he does what I he does what I call the Jim Shooter intro, which is which is very which is very much a a vestige of the '80s, where Jim Shooter, who was for a long time editor in chief at Marvel had this theory that any comic book is somebody's first comic book. So, so if you're going to have a team book, like an X-Men book or an x caliber book, everybody needs to establish for the reader who they are. And Claremont does this in, with the tech net in the most gratuitous and flat kind of way. People walk in and they say, hi, I'm joy boy. And I do this. Hi, yeah. I'm gate crasher. And I do this. And then like, <laughs> You say your name, you say what your power is, you use your power, and now you get off panel so that somebody else can have their moment. And, and it's and it's the entire tech net does this. Um, yeah. The ones who can't speak, Gatecrasher speaks for them. I love it so much, though. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in part because we got these wonderful sort of Alan Davis designs for these characters, too. And that's sort of one of the one of the last things I want to touch on is sort of, yeah, mm -hmm. like the style and everything. But we sort of get some of it established that they're going to be dealing with certain types of threats, right? They're going to be linked into this Marvel multiverse because we get the introduction mm -hmm. of, of Saturnine, who mm -hmm. um, has sent the Tadnek to, 
TechNet to kidnap Rachel. So we get kind of some of that established here, and we're not sure of the total scope of that yet, but definitely we've got beings from sort of multiple dimensions with multiple goals kind of all interacting here and sort mm-hmm. of setting setting up a sort of stage for Excalibur in that sense. Any thoughts, Andrew, about the antagonists? Um, I, I think the tone is absurdist, obviously, but like maybe vaudevillian coming back to the way that you guys are describing <laughs> yeah, it. Like, yeah. like they know their yeah. role and they they're they're gonna play it directly and without the slightest nuance whatsoever. Um, which makes them well each each of their powers and the tech net kind of have like comedy potential, and yeah, we see yeah. that sort of played out. Through each... <laughs> We're gonna turn you into wax. Here's like a funny scene of that happening, and like in a very fat shaming inappropriate one. Let's make Kitty like super fat and then have her fall down, and that's hilarious, right? <laughs> and it's like each of the each of the powers have like just sort of like a comedy beat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even the introduction of Gatecrasher, which is like she barely knows where she is she she doesn't really understand mm-hmm. the severity with which megan is approaching her and all that kind of stuff it, it's it's comedic these are not heavies mm-hmm. for lack of a better term mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and megan and megan establishes for you the reader who's not read captain britain i know who these people are so they must be captain britain villains keep up that's i mean she basically just says oh it's you i hate you and that's how much you know. Well, she's a Captain Britain character, so they must be Captain Britain characters. Okay. That's... But in the context of that fight scene, the sort of the mm-hmm. three-way fight between the Warwolves and the Technet and Excalibur, too, we see sort of that evolution of what we've been talking about with Kurt sort of throughout Sword is Drawn, where he becomes a point of view character within the context of the fight. And he's the one that we see having the internal monologue about, like, we're not fighting as a team. We need to oh, yeah, fight yeah. more as a team. And we see him sort of coming into that leadership role sort of mm-hmm. in the context of that fight, which, again, I think is really interesting. We start off with Kitty is the focal point and it kind of shifts to various focal points but this is definitely like sort of you see that Kurt's probably going to be that guy who's going to be in charge Mm -hmm. yeah continuing that thread we saw in his speech to Brian Kurt's not the one who would call people out like that and now he's again as you said fulfilling this leadership role that's been sort of teased out as one of his big character arc failings in the pages of uh, uncanny in terms of sort of big things that i want to sort of just touch on sort of setting up some of our future pods i want to talk about alan davis sort of maybe as our our, our last big convo mm-hmm. and you know whatever other things that you guys want to bring up what does alan davis's art bring to sort of setting up the character development that we've talked about as being really strong in this book what does it do in terms of setting up the context of this world in terms of setting up that sexiness that we've talked about a number of times. I'm sure we're going to be coming back and back to sort of Mm -hmm. gushing about Alan Davis's work, but just briefly off the top, what do both of you sort of think that he brings to the series in this intro? Very dramatic facial expressions and postures. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, leaning into the sort of melodrama or broad theatricality of Excalibur. He is, for me, very refreshing because, again, this is 1988. For the 80s and the 70s, there was a house style for Marvel in general and for for the lines in particular. And for the X Men, it meant you know do the best you can to draw like Paul Smith. That's like <laughs> that, that, that's that's where they were. And I, I'd said um, I'd said at this time uh, my favorite comic artist was probably John Romita Jr. It's a huge fan because Romita Jr. was very clearly in his early career. I draw like my dad. Hire me because I draw like my dad. That's what he did. And then over time, over his course, over his run on X Men, and later when he moves over to Punisher. He starts developing his own style and you can, and it was interesting to watch that develop. But one of the things that made him interesting in the eighties was he didn't look exactly like he was drawing like John Buscema, John Romita senior or Paul Smith, which is what everybody else was doing. He was doing something else. Davis is a complete, just threw that away. He's got a vibrant style. It's very expressive. It's almost cartoony, but also in a way so much more realistic than the than the how to draw Mar- draw the Marvel way Busima style that had been going on up until that point to where it it, it just felt fun and refreshing and it also it, he's so dynamic that it works with the series the women look different they all have a very they're all sexy but they're different kinds of sexy Kitty is a believable 15 year old girl uh Rachel looks like you know she's a grown woman she's probably 18 or 19 and Megan is a supermodel but yeah. they're but they're but she's trying to be a supermodel so there's they're yeah. different and they're identifiable and you can see you know kurt as this perfect athlete and brian as literally a brick house mm-hmm. you know he is mm-hmm. Br- brian looks like you know the best professional wrestler that you can possibly find which is interesting to see him that way because that's not what captain britain had been up until that point in his relative few 
mainstream Marvel appearance. Yeah, it's interesting the way he changes sort of the styling of some of the characters. And I think Captain Britain is a good example of that, right? I think sort of Brian's sort of cluelessness and kind of like, I want to say slow wittedness sort of throughout Mm -hmm. a lot of, especially of early Excalibur, Mm -hmm. I think is sort of represented in that very sort of square dominating sort of design of his body. He's very beautiful as well, but he's definitely very large and Mm -hmm. very hard and very solid. And I think that's sort of reflective of some of his thinking as well. And especially as it creates another contrast with sort of the grace and fluidity and sort of small of Kurt in contrast to him right Mm -hmm. I mean yeah I just think about Alan Davis like being so perfect for Excalibur because it's like he's both he's great at doing like grounded fantasy Mm -hmm. I mean sort of the individualization of the bodies is part of that his skill with facial expressions which are very dramatic but also very humanizing and then he's also just great at wild fantasy and he's great at action scenes and he's great at pacing and Mm -hmm. having that sort of sort of firm style and sort of really skilled hand sort of merging all of those different requirements for this very sort of tonally dissonant a time series and I think it will get into some of the issues drawn by other artists and Excalibur I think can come across as tonally dis- dissonant when you don't have Alan Davis's sort of pencil behind it but Alan Davis is able to sort of merge all of those things together and like almost like I mean he's the the, the, the definitive Excalibur artist and for, mm-hmm. for most fans I think yeah I Andrew think thoughts on thoughts on Davis love Davis so much um one thing I want to point out just because it, it is something distinctively different in this issue versus others same colorist Glynis Oliver but in yes. sort of drawn we're using a watercolor kind of muted palette mm-hmm. for me davis shines with like heavy vibrant colors which is what we yeah. see in the rest of the run mm-hmm. starting with issue one yeah, yeah. It, it is much yeah it 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 feels this was um the, also i mean i'm reading it digitally today because i didn't feel like going through all of my old back issues but this oh, I was curious was, about how we were all reading it. I'm yeah. reading it in like Excalibur classic trade paperback. Well, I've got <laughs> that, but it was, what's interesting about it is the Excalibur classic trade paperback was um, one of Marvel's, what they called at that time, prestige format books. So it's got a, um, the best I can, the best I can describe it for a modern reader is it was bound like a trade paperback that you would buy at a bookstore today. Um, a, you know, a combined heavier paper than the newsprint that other comics were on, but also very, um, very glossy. And so the color palette for Sword is Drawn is actually quite muted for what most books that came out in that format used yeah. and then the rest of the series i believe from the very beginning had gone to baxter paper which was the heavier the heavier paper than most newsprint comics of that time were but uses a much richer color palette as andrew said than this does so even though it wasn't the bound trade paperback it felt more like what marvel was doing with those than other comics that were coming out at that time did yeah like a prestige format yes yeah for for sure. I mean, yeah, so I can see it's sort of the intentionality there of even just advertising kind of the maturity of this series in a strange mm-hmm. way, like through kind of that choice. Mm-hmm. But um, we're going to keep coming back to Alan Davis and we're going to keep <laughs> coming back to a lot of these dynamics because we have, once again, 126 more episodes <laughs> to talk about <laughs> all of these things. Um, any sort of final thoughts you guys want to address with some of this origin stuff before we before we move on to Excalibur issue number one? Can, can we uh, maybe talk about the campfire? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, the, I was going to before, but I didn't want to interrupt the captain because I think that's the definitive Captain Britain and Megan shot, which sort of gives you, which I want to just analyze that one panel. So, so okay. So the story yeah, ends with like that's a transition. Yeah, <laughs> the story ends with like the most contrived setting ever, where they're just hanging out on a cliff in Scotland having a campfire. But it's perfect, and right? Like Kurt is like making toast and like he buttering is, yes. it or something. <laughs> <laughs> Where did this come? Yeah, I mean, is they. This a German thing? What is that? Well, I mean, most of them can fly. He can teleport. So I guess somewhere they stopped at a at like a local supermarket, picked up some groceries, had a campfire in the middle of nowhere where he's going to toast bread on a campfire <laughs> stick. I've, I've never done it this way, but okay. And there's this like, it, it is a little awkward uh, how hard they work to force the British mythology into the like professor x's mission (laughs) so there's this like one speech that just is like no these are the same thing we're going to be excalibur and camelot and xavier's dream uh and captain britain and megan just basically join them because yeah well and see that one panel so there's this one panel when they first get to the to the campfire which really sets up the weirdness of the premise for me because i understand why kitty Curtin, and rachel 
are the remaining X-Men. So we've got to follow this dream. I under, I'm even okay with Rachel being the one who gives the speech because she's like, I've been gone for two years. Yeah, no, I like and, that. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not stopping now, you know, um, cause Rachel for more backstory that we didn't give, um, she's not from our reality. She's from a future that she know cannot come to be at this point. So she knows that, that the entire circumstances that led her to be born are never going to happen. She is entirely a person out of time, out of reality. This is my life, so I'm going to make the best of it. I get that. I love this panel in that, you know, we've got a we've got going around clockwise. You've got Brian and Megan sitting together, and then you've got Kitty, then you've got Rachel floating but sitting there and then kurt and it sort of establishes all of their dynamics rachel does not sit on the ground she floats mm -hmm. she could sit on the ground but she's got telekinesis and just is very naturally this is how she relaxes and what's interesting to me is the fact that megan who's ridiculously powerful is sitting between the legs of captain britain as yeah. uh, as one might as a couple but it is also a him being extremely protective of her even at this point protective and as we'll find well actually we saw a hint of earlier often abusive but also it just establishes how incredibly big he is because this isn't just a woman leaning on her boyfriend this is a woman leaning on her ridiculously massive boyfriend so it kind of yeah. it sort of gives you so it, you know it very much establishes the scale but then also with Rachel actually floating while she gets the speech it sort of she's not going to be the leader but it establishes her place of aloofness above everyone else in the on the team yeah and her maturity as well and even just the mm -hmm. idea of the fire is like the light at the darkness and rachel wanting to hope in that optimistic future because as you yeah. said she's from this timeline where the x-men are killed and you know it's a total <laughs> horrorscape dystopia mm -hmm. so it's great to see her being kind of that optimistic character and giving that speech i was bothered by kind of the king arthur speech where i was just like is that the king arthur story you're kind of glossing that a little bit but that's fine it's a <laughs> take <laughs> It, it bears some resemblance to the King Arthur story. I mean, so we we didn't talk much about it because it doesn't matter for this. Um, but the odd calling the Excalibur, which is clearly just used as a we want, you know, we can't call them X-Men because we are publishing another X-Men book. Essentially, they decide to continue being the X-Men, only we're not going to call ourselves this for reasons. They don't really give a good reason. They totally should just be the X-Men, but they couldn't be because that book was still being published. Right. And they hadn't figured out that they could just have multiple books called X-Men, which is what they do now. So <laughs> they so so they so they so they're not gonna be the X-Men. We're going to be something else because there are no other X-Men. We're family. Megan, you're a mutant, you're in. Brian, you wanna be here just cuz? You know. <laughs> and 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 that's and he's he says sure and they kind of take this excalibur thing just because it sounds like x-men really it's, it's to it's to make it fit in with the publication line and this is probably these two pages of explanation for that are probably the most forced thing in the entire book uh, it's like a no sword sword is drawn yeah, yeah, see yeah. i'm using my power to make this sword and none of it really makes any sense but it doesn't matter because everything else was so delightful that it was just sort of a look i'm going to try to make this make sense so that i can keep publishing the book yes yeah. <laughs> and the idea that excalibur at the end of this is basically just a grief support group i mm -hmm. really yeah. like that moving forward i, I think that's perfectly mm -hmm. appropriate to everything that's been established and everything that's going to be you know coming down the line yeah and the last page so i'm looking at the last page now and you see like the hug of them with the phoenix force symbol behind them and kitty's like what the heck count me in and then captain britain says which doesn't sound like a line that would come from him with all my heart yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then we got this wonderful sum up the like text at the bottom is and so with laughter and transcendent joy the dream is reconsecrated and excalibur the most ancient and noble blade once more redrawn mm -hmm. I mean, it's super corny but i think that there's a lot going on just in that little caption <laughs> you know, redrawn, you know, is such a wonderful, like, descriptor for a reboot of a comic book, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but at its beginning in laughter and transcendent joy, too, emerging from this trauma is such a wonderful description of this team as well. And sort of some of the joy that I think is going to be at the heart of this series, sort of in that trauma. And I will note, too, that in the trade paperback edition, the very next page to that, facing it, um, is a black background page that's just a drawing of Widget's head, which yes. <laughs> gets us to the name of this podcast, which um, we'll talk about that on a future podcast when we get to it we'll, we'll, we'll keep those of you who don't know guessing until then i think but um last thoughts brian will never be that hopeful 
ever again in this no, series. No, that is no, literally <laughs> yeah, that that is literally the <laughs> most optimistic thing he says in the entire run. So don't be looking for it to come back. It's almost like I, I read it almost as foreshadowing, like, <laughs> oh boy, they're gonna move into your house in the next issue and you're gonna regret this. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. My theory on sort of the ending here and, and how it leads to the formation of the entire series, I think that it, it's a good enough issue and it's nuanced enough that it earns its contrivances here and there. Like there's a there's mm -hmm. a certain forgiveness after a while where you're just like, yeah, screw it. I'm, I'm going to go with this because everything else <laughs> is so good. And I think that's actually a good metaphor for the series as a whole in a weird way. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Take Excalibur. Find a pool of calm water throw the sword into it so i think we will leave it there we will return to a number of these topics in future episodes in greater depth as we do our issue by issue read through next we are moving from episode zero to episode one wherein we will discuss excalibur number one once again by claremont and davis once again from 1988 and that will be available in one week's time in the meantime if you liked what you heard please follow us like and review the podcast wherever you're listening to it or if you want to chat with us about excalibur or pitch yourself as a guest for a future episode we're open to that let us know you can reach out via our website goshgollywow.com where we've got some fun extras and via twitter at goshgollywow where we'll be posting daily pages from whatever issue we're reading that week and some more fun extras until next time thank you andrew and matt for a fabulous conversation thank you so much for listening and a special thank you to maximilian of thoughtform music for our epic theme song play us out